Hello friends, I am Anindita and welcome back to my channel Computer Engineering Made Easy. Today we are going to discuss about the concepts of sparse matrix. In this tutorial, we will learn what is a sparse matrix and why we should be concerned about storing a sparse matrix. We will also learn what are the different ways of representing a sparse matrix in a computer's memory. A sparse matrix is a matrix that has most of its elements as zero. Typically, if a matrix has at least two-thirds of its elements as zero, it is called a sparse matrix. The common way of representing a matrix in a computer's memory is by using a two-dimensional array. If we have a sparse matrix comprising of m rows and n columns, the space required by the matrix, if represented by a general two-dimensional array in the computer's memory, will be m into n into size of float. If the number of non-zero elements in the matrix is represented as nnz, the total amount of memory that will be required to store the non-zero elements will be nnz into size of float, while the rest of the memory will be responsible for storing zeros only. If we consider that the value of m and n is in the order of millions, while the value of nnz is negligible compared to it, will it be efficient to use a two-dimensional array to store the matrix? Definitely not, right? This gives rise to the concern of storage as well as the computational complexity of the operations associated with a sparse matrix. Hence, researchers have come up with the various methods by which we can represent a sparse matrix in the computer's memory. One such representation is the triplet representation, while the other one is called the compressed sparse row or the CSR representation. The CSR representation is also called Yale representation because it was developed by the Yale University. Now let us take a plunge into the concepts of the triplet representation. Let us consider a 5 cross 6 matrix as shown in this slide. The triplet representation corresponding to this matrix is going to have three columns. In the triplet representation, the 0th row is somewhat different than the rest of the rows. The zeroth row in the triplet representation is responsible for holding the dimension of the matrix or the order of the matrix and the number of non-zero elements in the matrix. Here in this case, the size of the original array is 5 cross 6. That means it has 5 rows and 6 columns. Accordingly, the value 5, which indicates the number of rows in the matrix, will go to the zeroth column of the triplet representation. The number of columns, that is 6, will go to the first column of the triplet representation and since the matrix has 6 non-zero elements, the value 6 will go to the second column of the triplet representation. The rest of the rows of the triplet representation will be responsible in storing the details about the non-zero elements of the matrix. In order to do so, we first scan the original matrix row-wise and whenever we encounter a non-zero element, we choose the row number, the column number and the value of the element to be appended as a row in the triplet representation. Here, 9 has the row number as 0 and column number as 4. Therefore, we enter 0, 4 and 9 as a row in the triplet representation. The next non-zero element is 8. 8 has 1 and 1 as the row number and the column number. Therefore, the entry corresponding to 8 in the triplet representation will be 1, 1 and 8. Next, we have 4. The row number and column number of 4 are 2 and 0. So therefore, we have the entry 2, 0 and then 4 for the number 4. The next non-zero element is 2, which has a row number 2 and column number 3. Therefore, 2, 3, 2 will be stored as an entry in the triplet representation. The next non-zero element is 5 whose row number and column numbers are 3 and 5 respectively. So the entry corresponding to 5 is 3, 5, 5. And the last non-zero element is 2, whose row number and column numbers are 4 and 2 respectively. So the entry corresponding to 2 is 4, 2, 2. Note that the triplet representation has nnz plus one number of rows, where nnz represents the total number of non-zero elements inside the array. Now, is this representation storage efficient? Well, for the matrix that we had considered earlier, the number of rows is 5, number of columns is 6. That means there are total 30 elements and 2 third of 30 is 20. Also, the number of non-zero elements here is 6. So therefore, the number of zeros in this particular matrix is 30 minus 6, that is 24. 
Now, since 24 is greater than two third of the num total number of elements in the matrix, that is greater than 20, we can say that this matrix is sparse. Now, since this matrix is a sparse matrix, and if we try to consider the triplet representation, the number of rows in the triplet representation will be n and z plus 1, that is equal to 7, and the number of columns will be 3. So 3 into 7, that is 21, is going to be the number of elements in the triplet representation of this matrix. So 21 is less than 30. Therefore, we can say that for this particular matrix, triplet representation will definitely be efficient in terms of storage. But in case we consider a dense matrix, in this case, the matrix has dimension 5 cross 6 just like the previous one, that is the total number of elements is 30. However, unlike the previous matrix, that number of non-zero elements here is 24, which leaves only 6 zeros in the original matrix. That means the number of entries in the triplet representation will have 25 rows and 3 columns. That means there will be total 75 elements in the triplet representation of this particular matrix. Now 75 is very much greater than 30. Hence, the triplet representation of a dense matrix is never beneficial. So for this case, the representation will not be efficient in terms of storage. The algorithm to generate the triplet representation from the original matrix is shown here. We need to first read the values M and N, which represents the order of the matrix, and SP, that is the original sparse matrix. We need two loops, I and J, where I will be exploring the original matrix row-wise, and J will be exploring the original matrix column-wise. Whenever we encounter a non-zero element, we increment the variable count, which was initialized as zero outside the loops. So therefore, whenever we come out of this particular loop, we have the number of non-zero elements in the original matrix SP stored in the variable count. Now using this value count, we create another array called trip, whose number of rows will be count plus one and number of columns will be three. Once we create this trip matrix, we will store the order of the matrix in the first two columns of the trip matrix and the number of non-zero elements in the second column of the trip matrix. So that has been taken care of by the line numbers 11 to 30. After this, we initialize the variable k as 1 and we again reiterate the entire sparse matrix SP. Here, when we encounter a non-zero element, we create a row inside the trip matrix, which is marked by k and we store i in the 0th column, j in the 1th column, indicating the row number and the column number of the element. And in the second column or the 2th column, we store the value itself, the non-zero value itself. Further, the k value gets incremented by 1. So when we come out of this loop, the trip matrix will be ready, holding the triplet form of the original sparse matrix. The implementation of the algorithm is somewhat like this. Here we have declared two pointer to pointer to integers sp and trip apart from the variables m, n and count. sp and trip will be responsible for creating the array. We will create the arrays sp and trip later on dynamically and m and n will be holding the order of the original matrix. Count will be responsible for counting the number of non-zero elements. We need two functions for this. First, we have to create the original matrix and then we will convert it into its triplet. For creating the original matrix, we simply create an array dynamically of size m cross n. If you are not comfortable with dynamic arrays, please refer to the link provided in the top right corner of the screen. So once the array has been created, we run a loop for i equal to 0 to m and j equal to 0 to n to ask for user input that will be stored in the original array. Once the array has been completed, uh, we then call the function create triplet, which will be responsible for converting the original array into its triplet version. So for this, we again start with initializing the variables. We run the loop from i equal to zero to m and j equal to zero to n to keep counting the number of non-zero elements inside the sparse matrix. Once we find the number of non-zero elements inside the sparse matrix, we create a array, two-dimensional array 
of size count plus 1 by 3 dynamically using these few lines. Once the array has been created, we store m, n and count in the first row of the trip matrix. Next, we again scan the array and whenever we encounter a non-zero element, we store the corresponding row number, column number and the value in the kth row of the trip matrix. K gets incremented in every iteration whenever a row is appended inside the triplet matrix. Finally, we display the triplet matrix. The output is somewhat like this. In this case, you see that the matrix that we have entered is a 5 cross 6 matrix and it is a sparse matrix. So the number of elements that is required in the normal SP representation is 30 elements, whereas for the triplet representation, we require only 21 elements. So therefore, we can say that for a sparse matrix, this implementation is storage efficient. Moving on to the next type of representation that is called the compressed sparse row or the CSR representation. The CSR or the Yale representation represents the original sparse matrix SP using three vectors called A, IA and JA. The vector A has size N and Z, that is the number of non-zero elements in the original matrix SP. It stores the values of the non-zero elements in the matrix in the order of traversing the matrix row by row. IA represents the row offset and it has typically the size of m plus 1, where m implies the number of rows. It stores the cumulative number of non-zero elements up to the i-th row, but not including it. It is defined by the recursive relation, i-a of 0 will be equal to 0, but i-a of i will be equal to i-a of i minus 1, plus the number of non-zero elements in the i minus 1th row of sp. The third vector is ja, and it has a size of the number of non-zero elements in the matrix. It stores the column index of each element of the vector A. For example, if we have a sparse matrix SP that looks somewhat like this with the non-zero elements marked in red, then the vector A will simply have the non-zero elements listed one after the other as experienced during a row-wise traversal. For example, if we start traversing the matrix SP row-wise, in the 0th row, we have first 3, then 4. So accordingly, we have 3 and 4. Next, in the 1th row, we have 5. So 5 comes after 4. In the next row, we have 4 and 1. So 4 and 1 are listed after 5. In the next row, we have 9. So 9 gets listed. And finally, in the last row, we have 4 and 3. So 4 and 3 gets listed after 9. The vector IA is somewhat tricky. It marks, as stated by the recursive relation, IA of 0 is equal to 0. IA of i will represent the cumulative number of elements till the i minus 1th row in the original matrix. For example, here the value of i is equal to 1. So if i is equal to 1, it will give us the cumulative number of non-zero elements till the row number 0. In the row number 0, we have two elements only. So 2 plus 0 gives us 2 over here. Next, for IA2, we will look at the cumulative number of elements before the 2th row in the sparse matrix S. So we count the number of elements in the 1th row, that is 1, and we add it to the previously stored element, that is 2. So therefore, we get this 3. Next, in the 2th row, we have two elements, 4 and 1. So 2, when added to this 3, gives us 5. In the next row, we have 1 element. So 1 added to 5 gives us 6. Next, in the last row, we have 2 more elements. So 2 added to 6 gives us 8. This is how the vector IA is constructed. Another interesting aspect is that it identifies the row offset. For example, the first 0 indicates the row from where the non-zero element starts. So here, as you can see, this 0 marks the beginning point from where the vector A is starting. Next, we have 2. That means there are two elements in the 0th row. So this 2 marks the position after those two elements in the vector A. In the next row, we have got only one element, that is 5. So 1 when added to 2 gives us 3. That marks the end of the second row. In the next row, we have two more elements, that is 4 and 1. 
So 2 added to 3 gives us 5. So you see 5 marks the end of the 2th row. Similarly, we have got only one element in the 3th row and therefore 1 added to 5 gives us 6. So this 6 provides us the end of the 3th row. Finally, we have 2 elements in the last row. 2 added to 6 gives us 8. So 8 marks the end of the vector A. So here you see these arrays are simply just separating the individual non-zero elements that happen to be in individual rows. For example, the first two elements 3 and 4 are present in the 0th row. So their beginning and their end are marked in the IA vector. Next, in the next row we have 5. So the beginning of the row and the end of the row is marked by 2 and 3. Next, we have 4 and 1 in the next row, so their beginning and their end are marked by the two elements in the IA vector. Next, we have 9, so its beginning and end is also marked. And finally, we have 4 and 3, so their beginning and end are also marked by the elements in the IA vector. Coming to the next vector, that is JA, this is pretty much simple. We identify each and every non-zero element row-wise, and we simply mark the column. So in this case, 3 is present in column number 2, so 2 is entered in JA. Next, 4 has got a column value of 4, so 4 is appended in JA. 5 has column value 2, so 2 is there. Next, 4 has column value 1, so 1 is present. 1 has got a column value 5, so 5 is there in JA. 9 has column value 0, so 0 is present. Next, we have 4, and 4 is there in column number 3, so 3 is appended in JA. And value 3 has got a column number 4, so 4 has been appended in J. This is how the CSR representation looks like. So overall you see, for this particular matrix, it's a 5 by 6 matrix, we have 30 elements and we require 30 into size of float storage space if we stored them in the computer's memory using a two-dimensional array. On the other hand, if we use the CSR representation, we only need 22 elements. So this is comparatively much cheaper than the two-dimensional array representation. Transforming a normal sparse matrix into its YEL form or the CSR form is pretty easy. For that, we need to first read the values of M and N, that is the number of rows and columns of the original sparse matrix, and we initialize 0 in the 0th position of the vector IA. We need two variables i and j for the loops, and uh, we are introducing these three variables, count a, count ia, and count j a, all are set to 0. As we start the loop, for i equal to 0, i less than m, we initially reset the r count value to 0. Next, we start the jth loop. As we read individual elements, we check it is 0 or not. If it is not equal to 0, then we simply put it inside this a of count a. So this is going to create the a vector and we put the column value of the element in the JA vector. So here, count A marks the point where we can insert new elements in the vector A, and count JA implies the position in the vector JA where we can insert the new elements. So once we have in inserted elements in the count A and count JA position of A and JA respectively, we increment both of them. And at the same time, we also increment the count variable and the R count as well. So once this particular for loop has been executed, the inner for loop has been executed, we get the A and the JA vectors updated. Now it is time for the IA vector to get updated. What does the IA vector store? As we know, the IA of I is equals to IA of I minus 1 plus R count. So in this case, this R count variable is counting the number of elements that are non-zero within that specific row. Accordingly, we simply check the value of IA of I minus 1 and we add R count to it. So for the first case, IA of 0 was 0. So from for IA equal to 1, this will be IA of 0 plus R count. So this is 0 and whatever is the number of non-zero elements in the 0th row, that will get stored in IA. So that's all and finally we display the contents of A, IA and J. With that we come to the end of our today's tutorial. If you think you have benefited from this, you have learned something new, please make sure to like, share and subscribe my channel and stay home, stay safe, happy learning.